Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's workshop with Nairobi Garage. It's a pleasure to be here today, and we appreciate you taking the time to engage with us in this forum. My name is Evelyn Mumbi, and I'm, I'm a community man manager at Nairobi Garage Spring Valley. For those that, are, that may not be familiar with Nairobi Garage, allow me to do a brief introduction. Nairobi Garage started off, allow me to do a brief introduction. Nairobi Garage is Africa's largest and coolest business and innovation workspace and co-working community. We believe that co-working drives innovation because whenever people share physical spaces, they are able to collaborate to create things they wouldn't have on their own. The flexible workspace that Nairobi Garage give your business space to grow, get connected to large networks of similar minded professionals and to increase your impact and scale. We offer a virtual network of a thousand plus entrepreneurs and professionals home to over 150 growth focused innovative businesses weekly events for members and the wider business community and we have four central locations that is kilimani karen spring valley and now we have one in delta our spaces offer a variety of amenities including fully furnished office spaces, breakout spaces, reliable internet, and bottomless tea and coffee to keep you alert as you work. We host workshops every Tuesday to expose our members to the larger business community and explore areas of interest to entrepreneurs within our ecosystem. In this week's work workshop, we are delighted to have Pauline Warimu, and Shh. Pauline Warimu will take us through the investment, your investment appetite and uh, how to save. She is a financial partner with CORE. So I'll hand over the stage to Pauline and she can go ahead and just take us through. Thank you, Evelyn, for that introduction. Um, and good morning, everyone. We are grateful that you created time to come and join us for this webinar. So I'll, I'll do a brief introduction of myself before we get into the presentation. As it, Evelyn said, I'm a partner with CORE, but my main profession is a financial coach. Before that, I was a banker for many, many years. And um, I also help small businesses to upskill the SMEs. as I speak, let me come on. Hello guys, just give us one minute. Pauline is having a bit of technical issues. She's just trying to load the PowerPoint presentation. Then she'll go ahead and speak in just a minute. We'll also have some polls, uh, which will be put on the, on the poll tabs. Please populate them as we go on with the session. And you're free to ask any sort of questions on the questions tab. Thank you.
Okay, guys, sorry for that. Um, I lost my connection. That's the, those are some of the things you have to go through <laughs> with virtual meetings. So I'm going to get back to my presentation in a minute. Okay, so our topic for today is uh, investment 101. That's what we are going to discuss, just the basics of what you need to know as an investor. The big question is, is it even the right time to talk about this, going by what's happening in the country, what we've gone through maybe in the last one and a half years with the pandemic? But my answer is yes, investments can be done at any one time. So a quick um, definition of what investments are. It's just the action or process of putting money aside for profit. And this is assumed that you'll be having this money by saving it from somewhere or you've been putting it aside. But the key word here is for profit. So you must be doing this because you want to make some money on top of what you had initially put in. Now, uh, before we get into the real investment options the do's and don'ts. I thought we should begin with something that's not about investments per se, but just something to keep our brains or our thought process up to speed, which I call seasons of life. And this is phases that any human being, when you're born to the time when you leave this earth, has to go through. We have three stages of the human life cycle. The first stage is what we call foundation, and normally this is when you're born, from the time you're born to the time when you're about 24 years. Basically here you spend your time and life on education. So there's birth, childhood, and then maybe high school and on to university or college. The next phase on, uh, in uh, the human life cycle is life planning. You have two categories there. For young adults who are around 24 to 30, here you're expected to have, of course, finish college or university, get employment, and you're just beginning your life. Um, even from the photo there, this person is still very thin, slim, lean. Maybe for the girls, you're still size 10, 11, 8. Then you move to another phase where we call you a mature adult. And in our case here, because we are working, we expect that probably you're now starting to get promotions at work, you're moving from one grade to another. It's a stage also where you acquire things, assets. Uh, you also acquire a spouse. Um, now people are getting to settle much, much later in life because careers have taken over our space. Not like before when our parents maybe got married when they're slightly younger. So there's expansion, both physically, as you can see that gentleman, he's suddenly maybe a size 14, 16 or 20. Um, and so you're referred to as a mature adult. Then we move to another phase in our life, which we call succession planning. There are two categories here as well. Senior adult who is between 50 to 60. Generally, society expects that here you've done groundwork. You've brought up children, you've invested, you've acquired, you've expanded. Now your children are at the last stage of education where they're graduating. And if you're blessed, then you're becoming a grandfather or you'll become a grandmother. The last phase of succession planning is senior citizen where you're over 60. So here, most of the people, the parents, is where our parents fall. You're considered to be a retiree like you're, you're being faced out of, of town <laughs> and people look at you like, aren't you leaving for a country? So as a senior citizen, there's very little activity. In fact, if anything, now you look back either with regret or with pride. You'll find also this is where parents start calling their kids, showing them property A and B belongs to you. When I go, please take care of this business. And so I thought it's important to just give a background based on your seasons of life 
so that as we move to investment, you can look at where exactly you fall and the decisions that you're going to make therein. For example, if you found a 70 year old taking a loan right now in a financial institution to build a house, it, it, it kind of feels odd or rather looks odd because you, you would think even if you're this person in the bank analyzing their portfolio, you think this is a little bit too late into life. How will this person pay? And that's exactly why we thought we should have this uh, discussion today so that you can tell when to do certain things and how or why. So we move to the factors that you consider uh, when you're becoming an investor or as an early investors. And which ones are these? I listed a few of them. One of them is that you must look at your personal financial roadmap. What do you really want in terms of your financial uh, capabilities, achievements? You have to have it all planned out. At what point are you buying asset A? At what point are you disposing it? So you must really think and remember that this is a very, very important factor. The second one is risk appetite. You're either risk averse or a risk taker. It's said that bankers are very risk averse. We don't get compelled into jumping things. We really analyze and look at things critically. Entrepreneurs are the opposite of bankers. They dive right in. An opportunity comes and they strike it well hot. Another factor to consider as an early investor is that risk appetite versus a reward. You must have a situation in your mind where you know you're diving into this, but what's the reward thereafter? Is it commensurate? Because there's no investment that doesn't have a risk. There's also no investment that doesn't have a reward. So are you able to balance what's the ratio? Then we think also of something I call return on investment. This uh, will be will consider things like investment at amount and what time it takes for you to get a return on that. For example, if you're two people, one wants to invest in an Uber, another one wants to invest in Forex. So what are the initial amounts in question? And how long will that take for me to get back my return? The person getting into Uber business might take a little bit longer to realize their initial capital. So again, have the return on investment in mind. You also need to look at your age. Going back to the previous slide uh, on the human cycle, how old are you? Where are you at in your life? Are you a young adult? Are you a mature adult, senior adult, senior citizen? So your age matters. Now, for me, who's at the place where I'm kind of uh, getting into senior citizen, I, there's some investments I won't touch because they might just bring high blood pressure to me if I hear that the return isn't what I expected just because of my age. But you might be just a young upcoming person, young mature adult. You have the oomph, you have the zeal, you have the money. So you might get into forex trading, for example, which I can't touch. So consider your age. Now, what are the investment tools available for us here in Kenya, for example, or just across globally? We have several tools. Uh, I could categorize them into financial tools and non-financial tools. Some of them are bonds that you, you, you open an account in uh, our central bank here. Uh, they are called treasury bonds. We take maybe three to 10 years. You have treasury bills. Those take a little bit shorter a period to mature, three months to six months to one year. There's real estate options. You have currency where you convert your Kenya shillings into another foreign currency account like a dollar, uh, euros or Great Britain pounds. Then precious metals, very rare for us, but very good in terms of having like maybe appreciation in value, gold, silver, diamond. And I wanted to also discuss vehicles that are really practical here in Kenya and that we can get into it, especially after the pandemic. These are the top maybe six or so 
uh, areas which you can consider investing. So financial tools, in addition to what I've said, would be a pension fund. This is where you, every month, you keep aside some amount from your salary into a pension fund for you when you get, you get to the senior citizen or succession planning. Because you know, needs don't retire. You still need to fuel, you still need to visit your grandchildren. There's medical waiting for you. So a pension fund is very crucial. And you could talk to your HR department and ask them if they can give you more information if you already are not doing that to start putting away a certain percentage. Usually 5% of your salary is good enough to start with. We have circles, uh, saving societies in Kenya. We have stocks and shares in the Nairobi Stock Exchange. Good stocks right now or shares to invest in is in, uh, in the banking industry, is um, cooperative shares, cooperative bank, equity bank, uh, KCB. Those are good bets. And then in the telco industry, Safaricom, which I think is a, has a monopoly, but have been having very good financial results of late. Agriculture is another place. And here I want to say agribusiness specifically. What our parents or our grandparents did was agriculture. Maybe it didn't bring so much value. But now we're in a space where we call, agri, we call it agribusiness because of the value chain addition. You process... A, a, a something, let's say tomatoes, from the point where you plant them to where you harvest them, you export or even make tomato paste and sell locally. So agribusiness. Again, after COVID, we have the ICT space, cyber security, data storage. Those are good places where you can invest your money in. And in fact, virtual education is another place. When COVID hit again, most of the things including this meeting we are having today when virtual otherwise before then we used to physically meet maybe it was expensive and we didn't think about it so now we are having virtual education virtual conferences uh virtual seminars virtual webinars like this ones another place is urban transport and logistics what do i mean the uber eats the safe border those are places you can have money put in and you'll get good returns. Deliveries, many people work from home now. So virtually everyone is just on delivery mode. Um, the other place is retail business, fast moving goods in the beauty industry, food industry, um, uh, the, the, the basics that people need in the house. That's a good place to put money in. You buy something for 100, sell it for 120. You already have 20 shillings there. Real estate. Now, here I want to put a small disclaimer that of late, it's not a very, very lucrative business. We all know that, again, due to this pandemic, many of the landlords are now left with their houses gaping or their properties because at the end of the day, the people who used to rent these facilities, us, we've either lost our jobs or our salaries have been downgraded, but we hope that it will pick up in due course. And real estate has metamorphosed to very many things like Airbnb. You can also lease a space, convert it into malls, small mall spaces, where you now lend to individuals. Then your education. We always never think that this is an area where you should invest. They say knowledge is power. Please take time to put money into yourself in terms of personal development, where you increase your knowledge and you'll be a better person as time goes by. Again, we're in a space where you have to be like a jack of all trades when it comes to your area. You can't sit and say that I was trained to be a front office person. And this is all I know. Even in a salon, now you're having people who used to do your hair for the girls, doing nails, also doing pedicure and any other thing that comes in that salon for that a client comes for in that salon. So invest in your education. You will never go wrong. In fact, that should be the first place for you to put in money. Now, what are the best investment uh, practices? We have rules, do's and don'ts. If you look at this photo, this guy is carrying some notes and he's holding very dearly onto them. 
it's like a baby, you know, for those of us who have children. Um, and that is what we really need to focus on in this webinar. You must have, uh, you must have thoughts around what you're doing when you're investing. And some of the best practices are, one, before you sit down and say, I'm putting my money in place X, where I had showed you the tools and vehicles, please put aside an emergency fund that can at least last you for six months. I had a debate with my colleague earlier on, and she wondered and said, Pauline, can you really have money that, that you know, six months emergency fund? And I said, yes, because if you didn't, and something went wrong with this investment, sometimes it does go awry, not of your fault of your own, then what happens to your livelihood? So six months of your current monthly budget, put it aside. Where? In the tools that I have shown you earlier or discussed earlier. Two, one of the other investment practices is have a mix of investments. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. You must diversify. Because as we say, the real estate industry was doing very well before COVID. Now, if you have a house, it's a pain because you may take so long to get a tenant and you're being forced to even lower the rents for you to get any meaningful return. So have a mix of investments. Third thing is rebalancing of portfolio. Here is just try and see. I started, for example, with real estate. Is it doing well now? No. So you might have to make a decision where you say, dispose of that property, get into another area. So every often, usually one annual, you know, once a year, look at your portfolio and redistribute your investment mix, okay? The third thing is preservation. Just like this guy at the beginning, you must have that in mind. You're not putting money to lose it. Okay, you must put money knowing that I'm putting in money, just like the definition on investment says, to make a profit. So by all means, try and preserve it. Either through capital gain, if you buy a piece of land today for 200,000, it is most likely the next year, all factors considered constant, it will be 250,000. So that's a good place to put in your money. Don't put money in a loss making, investment portfolio or area so preserve that investment even if it's in terms of currency let's hope and pray that yes if you put in your money in dollars today it's at 110 you're hoping that maybe at the end of the year it should be at 113 you'd have gained three shillings what are the tips that you should consider before making investments one indulge an expert we Kenyans have a problem here. Many of us go by hearsay, go by peer pressure, or just by what we saw somebody doing. Please indulge an expert in the field that you want to make that investment in. I said I'm a banker. I know very little about agribusiness. So if I want to invest in pigs, it's more prudent for me to sit with an expert in that field, most likely an entrepreneur who's done it before me, to gives me the ups and downs of that business. So indulge an expert. But maybe what we do mainly is just say, ah, my brother, you know, he invested in Safaricom shares. You, you don't want to know how much he made. So once you tell me that, I quickly get into it based on your brother's experience. The second thing, if it's an institution, Peru's financial statements, this you can easily get either from the actual institution physically or online, look for their financial statements and see over the past one year, two years, how has this institution been performing? Have they been on a profitable trend or on a loss-making trend? And don't worry, many people don't like reading this profit and loss operational cost. Get somebody to interpret this for you because then that way you can be able to make an informed decision. Third tip, Think of the owners of that institution. Who are they? Are they of a rep good reputation? Are they good standing integrity-wise? Who are the shareholders? Do they have scandals in the past? Have they been known to have been involved maybe in corruption deals? Were they ever taken to court? 
kindly just look through the owners because that usually gives you a red flag of how your investment is going to look or end up. Another aspect is their previous project. You must see something that they have done. Let me use real estate again. Where is this these people have built? Which projects have they completed? Can they give you referrals? Are they happy to give you contacts of previous customers who've invested in them? If there's a bit of a problem and they're not willing to disclose and say, call Pauline, we did a project for her at Place X three years ago, another red flag. Exit clause. What do I mean here? For many investments, based on my previous experience again, it really takes care of the person, you, who's investing in that. You'll do an agreement, uh, a contract, but it really takes care of what will happen to you when that investment portfolio or uh, deal goes wrong. Please check out and see how you're covered. Please insist on an exit clause where if you're done with it, you don't think you want to continue with it, there's a way out. And here you need to involve a lawyer with a, a good legal understanding so that before you part with that money, everything, all loopholes are taken care of. Finally, scammers. Uh, of late, there's a, a video, YouTube video going around for one of our comedians. I'm sure most of us have watched it. It's called Wash Wash. Papa Le Freddy or somebody. Yeah, I mean, it's so hilarious, but so very true. You see, we're in a situation where we, we no longer want to work very hard. You know, you don't want to take time to let these investments grow. And then people always say, ah, it, it, the, the returns are so low. Why should I put my money in, in fixed deposit to only earn 2,000 after six months? So there are many Papa Freddy's out here right now. And guys, it's the year preceding elections. Remember, everybody is crumbling for some pie of that money. So you'll have scammers coming up with all sorts of stories. Please watch out for the red flags before you put in your money. In fact, you might just be better off holding on a bit and letting this face go before you put in your hard earned cash. Now, my take for today or my take home to you today is that I'd like to say anything that costs you your peace is too expensive. If you put in money in a place that now after signing up that contract, after getting your copy, you start getting diarrhea, you start getting ulcers, you know your blood pressure is up, then that is a wrong decision. So anything that you think will cost you your peace of mind, will affect your day to day, is too expensive to venture. So I always recommend you put in something that even if it went haywire, it won't affect you. You will not die of shock you will not be admitted in hospital, your life will still continue. So anything that costs you your peace is too expensive to venture in. And now I want to get into the Q&A session. Um, Evelyn tells me we, we do the polls first. We had some questions for you. And uh, we'd like you to take a little, maybe two, three minutes of your time to do the polls and then we can give a feedback on what the results look like. Okay, so maybe I can go through the polls um, that you, you've populated. So the first question was, what motivated you to save and invest? And we had uh, three options, securing your future, peer pressure and not sure. So majority of you say that you you did in uh, the motivation for you to save and invest was because of securing your future and that stands at 83%. 12% uh, of you said peer pressure, 6% said not sure. The second poll question, was what investments, tools, or vehicles have you used to save? 
Uh, first option was money market fund and, and equity. That one stands at 35%. Your education, 16% of us. Business, 13%. In real estate, 10%. In currency, maybe other, other currencies, dollars, uh, pounds, euros, that stands at 10%. Others, any other that doesn't fall under these categories that we've listed, 10%. Bonds, only 6% of you have invested in, those, in that tool. So the last question we had for the polls was, do you save? And if yes, what percentage of your income do you save? So there's an, well, three options there. 20% of your income, 56% said yes to that. Uh, tw above 20%, only 25% of us do that. And nothing, zero, because that's also another reality, 19%. So well done, guys. It seems like we have a, a lot that's, that seems to know what investment is all about, and you're doing well. So keep going. And now I'd like us to move to the questions that you may have to just make, drive this home. Uh, the first question I have is from Jesse Keegan, and he's asking, can I invest in more than one industry at the same time? My answer would be yes to that, because remember, one of the tips I gave is, please diversify your portfolio, have a mix of investments, yes. But here, I want to put a word of caution to it. Also, don't spread yourself too thin. Maybe it's good to really stick uh, to your lane, which is more passion-driven. That way, you have the zeal and energy to do something that also brings you money. So yes, you can invest in more than one industry. Maybe one industry at a time would be my, my take on that. There's another question from David Rones, he's asking, to how much extent is a risk in business worth dropping it? Well, to what extent is a risk in business worth dropping it? I think for me, it's, it's the quote that I ended uh, with. If something costs you your peace, it's too expensive. So David, if you're feeling like there's that inner voice telling you, stop, this isn't the right thing or you're having a second guesses about something, that, that should be a red flag. And maybe that's worth dropping it because it might lead to other things that really you didn't anticipate. Because remember, investing is for profit, not stress. Bien, uh, you're asking, how do I train a child on saving? What is the recommended age to start instilling the skills in them? So. I think um, a child who's as young as three or four, that would be a good age. How do you train them? You need to bring it down to their level. Simple things like if you give them money or somebody gives them money, what I did to my son as early as when he was four is I had three envelopes. One was written spend, one is written save, and the other one is written give. So for children, it's good to give them an option of 40% for spending, 10% for giving, uh, and 50% and for saving. Because when you are young, you should save as much. Uh, because we assume that you still are in the face of education. You know, you're somebody else's problem. All your needs are taken care of. So inculcate a culture where you are able to save as much as possible when you're young. And so that's how I would say that you can instill the culture of saving in them. There's a question from Victor Kenneth. He's asking, how do we read financial statements? What do we look at there specifically? So for financial statements, which I honestly don't like looking at, I'm one of those people who it gives headaches. There are small things, uh, specific things that you'd look at. First, there are operational costs. Uh, what was their initial capital investment in it? And then just basically if they made profit or losses. So the P&L statement. But as I said, 
get an expert. Don't sweat it. Nowadays, help is, is, is a stone throw away. Don't kill yourself with it. Get an expert to translate for you or interpret for you these results. Victor is also asking another question. He says, where can we get experts in the field and how much do they charge? Most accountants would help you with this. Also, Google is your best friend. In fact, that's a cheaper one. So if you don't want to go the spending way, um, please use Google and you will be sorted. But an expert is best. Then um, I think I, I want to continue. Or oh, can I, there's another question. Can I invest in more than one industry at the same time? Yes, the answer is yes. That's perfectly okay. Because we said you can diversify. You should diversify your investments. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. In terms of, um, do you know or project which industry? Well, things have changed. The, the, the places that I give, uh, the tools or vehicles that I give, those ones are based on research done in 2020 to 2021. So those are the most current places where you, you can give up, give up, it gives a good indication to where you can put your money. Victor Kenneth has asked another question. What are the investment vehicles available for youth in campus? Victor, uh, when you're in campus, maybe it's good to go for the financials first, um, fixed deposit accounts, uh, forex, in, in forex denominations specifically. Uh, you can also put in treasury bills at central bank. Shares are also good because then the risks may not be as high uh, for you because you're in the foundation stage of education. And also maybe the income may not be as much. Again, you're still learning, so your risk appetite may not be, or risk, uh, you're not very able to, to take on too much risk. So that would be a good place for, for, for a student or those are good places for a student to invest. Then David Ronis is asking, forward looking information is not available to guide business. Where can data be found? Okay, so of late David, the government has tried their best. I don't know if to say on paper or practically, but you can get this from many organizations that are there. Uh, Kenya Bureau of Statistics is a good place. Kenya Private Sector uh, Alliances is a good place. Also, the Ministry of Trade is also a good place. Don't shy off. Look for information. Walk into a bank. Even if you're not a client of that bank, look for a business uh, relationship manager and they will guide you. So we have another question here that says, I don't have enough money for an expert. Which investments are safe and will not give you a headache? Okay, so assuming you don't have any money, <laughs> in which most of us have, I don't have at the moment because of the, the, the issues surrounding us as a country or individuals. So the safe ones are where you you've weighed the risk and the and, and the and the and the you, you've weighed your risk appetite and you've seen the reward is, is kind of okay. And these are financial tools. I always say that's our best place to begin. Circles, fixed deposits, treasury bills, because as sure as day and night, you are able to tell that you will get your 1,000 shilling back from the 10,000 that you put. So there's another question uh, from John Kiganda. Should I invest within my area of passion only? John, not really, but this would be a good uh, starting point. Because if you do something out of passion, first it, you give it your all, your zeal, your energy. And best of all, it then gives you money. But if you want to go outside your area of passion, then involve an expert in that field, do your research. Um, the other question is, um, Fideli says, is there sound? Oh, that's something else. Okay, uh, Bien says, thank you, Pauline, for responding to my questions. So I think uh, we still have a, a little bit more of time. And uh, because I still, I, I don't see any more questions at the moment, 
and if they come in, I'll go back to that. I just want to give you my personal story on investments. So for many years, I said I worked in the bank and I didn't know these things that I have uh, spoken about today. For me, it was more of hearsay. I invested because the opportunity to borrow was there. In the banks, the employees get very good rates. So I blindly followed what my colleagues did or said, you know, we should invest in land in Kitengela or you should uh, buy shares in the Nairobi State Stock Exchange. Put money in the circle. So I remember when I was employed, after three months, I, I got confirmed and somebody from our circle came and placed a form on, on top of my desk and said, join the circle. I didn't even know what a circle was. So I filled the forms and I gave them in and then to HR. And after some time, they started uh, deducting the, 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 the shares from me. So then uh, later on, somebody says after about six months now, so that was nine months after employment, you know, you can borrow from your circle. And I was like, oh, OK, I didn't know. So I blindly went into the circle and borrowed. Now, I had money that I had in my account and didn't know what to do with it. So do you see the risk <laughs> of lack of information or just going by the, the, the crowd? So what I did foolishly, took the money and gave it to my mother and said, do you know what? Um, here is 40,000. I joined a circle when I got employed and now I'm able to, to borrow 40,000. Now, well, she had use for it and she gladly took it. But what I didn't consider were things like it was going to be charged an interest, uh, a loan costs, you know, it, it, the, the facility costs money. So again, I started paying for a loan, which I didn't really even have a real need for it or I hadn't planned. Remember I said financial planning. So, and that continued for over three decades. I think to be quite honest, I blindly just invested. But now I know better because it's good to invest for future. There's nothing absolutely wrong with investing, but please have a plan. Because then also in my course of work, I also found clients who just came and borrowed money with an intention to do something. But later it ended up being something else. You know, someone says they were to go buy a piece of land, but ended up going to Dubai using everything and came out with nothing. Nothing wrong to go with, uh, to, uh, nothing wrong with going to Dubai or a holiday destination, but you cannot use the money that you have borrowed to go to a holiday destination because when the time comes to pay, where will you, how will you make the repayment? Because then it didn't earn any interest. So plan your investment portfolio well. Don't blindly do it. So I don't know if there are any other questions that you may have or you'd like to share your investment journey. Any hits and misses? I think we can give you a chance to do that. Okay, I think I've seen a question from Evelyn, uh, no, Elizabeth Mwangi. Elizabeth is asking, any advice on offshore investments, equity, etc.? What's your experience? So Elizabeth, these are good uh, place to invest. Offshore investments are good simply because you do them in a foreign currency. The returns are usually good, but also very high risk. So what's your experience? I once burnt money in such an offshore investment uh, portfolio. It was based, I think, somewhere in, in uh, South America. But the person who was running it was here in Kenya, had a very beautiful office. The directors were the who's who's of this country. So again, as I said earlier on, my investment journey in the bank was based on pressure, peer pressure. This was again uh, from a referral of one of my colleagues who did very well in terms of their returns. So, but when I put in my money there, the whole thing went, uh, it, it collapsed. So offshore investments are awesome, but you have to really do due diligence because then you can't physically go to that person and demand back your money. Well, even if you did, 
it may take a long time to recover that. So be very, very careful when you're doing that. And maybe I want to add here that you, you have deals like Forex trading, uh, Forex trading, cryptocurrencies. Those are things that have come up of late for the youth especially. My advice is put money that you can afford to lose. Money that won't cost you your sleep. Money that won't make you be auctioned money that won't affect your day-to-day -day life you can still meet your monthly expenditure so if you have the oomph if you have the risk go for it but that is the guiding principle uh, there's another question here is forex a good place to invest yes because the returns are good uh, so high risk high return again is it money you can afford to lose? If it is, then it's okay. Because you see, because of the fluctuations in the international market, you may really not have control over it. So for short term, high risk, high returns, yes, put an amount that is comfortable for you to lose in case the investment went haywire. Um, I don't see any other questions for us today. So I think I want to hand over the meeting back to Evelyn to guide us further on the next, um, the next agenda. Thank you. So thank you, Pauline. Thank you for coming in and just uh, teaching us on investments and how to invest and how to save. We have really taken a lot away from it. I've actually been interested in uh, Forex and I've been wondering where to start. And as you've said, the best thing is get a guide from an expert. So I will be doing that from here henceforth. So thank you for such a wonderful informative session. A special shout out to all the attendees and especially those that are actively engaged and asking questions. We appreciate your engagement and are glad you've gained a lot from this session. CORE will be extending a free 30-minute consultation on investments from today's session. Nairobi Garage is also extending to each of you a free day pass to work at any of our four locations across Nairobi. You will have more details on these offers in your email by the end of the day. Thank you so much and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.